Hello again, everybody. It's Scott Casper, Takedown Media. Our coverage of the sport continues today. We're joined by the publisher of Wrestling Insider Magazine. That's News Magazine, by the way, otherwise known as WIN. That is the magazine of choice for many of you, including us at Takedown. The publisher joins us now, Brian Van Clay. Brian, how are you? I'm doing well, Scott. How are you this morning? Uh, very good. It's it's an, Obviously, it's a very... Um, Interesting time of the year, as much as the collegiate season has stopped, news about the collegiate season has not. And I'm talking in particular about the Dan Hodge Trophy and those that are being uh, uh, considered for that trophy. Let's go back and talk a little bit about how the Dan Hodge Trophy uh, came about. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, Win Magazine founder Mike uh, Mike Chapman and his wife Bev, who started the magazine back in the mid mid nineties, nineteen ninety four, actually, uh, really wanted to create an award back then that would epitomize uh, domination, that would uh, inspire and motivate the top collegians to go for the fall and to not just be content with. Uh, winning NCAA titles and, and that kind of thing, but to really go out to separate themselves from, from their peers, to uh, seek to pin opponents or beat them badly uh, in points, uh, depending on how a match played out. So they created uh, the Dan Hodge Trophy, named after the uh, infamous Danny Hodge from the University of uh, Oklahoma, who was a three-time uh, NCAA champ and uh, never surrendered a, a takedown in his uh, entire collegiate career. So starting back in 1994, uh, they created the equivalent of the Heisman Trophy in wrestling, Scott, and we have been uh, doing it and, and proudly uh, presenting it every year since then. So we're excited about this uh, 22nd annual award this year in 2016. And uh, as you and I were talking a little bit about off-air before this conversation, uh, the field of, of four finalists is an exceptional one, and uh, all of them great student-athletes and representatives of the sport, and it's been a lot of fun seeing all the internet uh, buzz and, and momentum and hype both during the year leading up to the postseason and now, of course, after the NCAA championships finished on uh, who should be the recipient of this year's Hodge Trophy. This is, um, it's it's always contentious for sure, but this year, uh, perhaps I've seen more campaigning uh, by the uh, universities, uh, the institutions where the athletes uh, uh, compete and, and, and go for their you know, academic education. Um, we're seeing uh, clubs, we're seeing families, we're seeing uh, uh, you know, wrestlers just stepping back and waiting to see what happened and not really truly being involved in the process. Perhaps some of them are so shy, you know, you know what I'm talking about, but there, there, that means the community is actually involved, and I love that part. Let's talk about criteria for the award. Uh, there are a number of elements that go into this, and, um, and, and perhaps you could speak to the actual criteria. Yeah, I sure will. That's obviously one of the most commonly asked, uh, commonly asked questions we have for the award is in regards to how does the process work, what are the criteria, how do you evaluate finalists based on those criteria, uh, there are seven criteria, a wrestler's record, number of pins, dominance on the mat, quality of competition, past credentials, uh, sportsmanship, citizenship is number six, and then seventh and finally, uh, heart. So is, is what that we've in always order done... Of, is that in order of importance or perhaps just in the way it was written out? Uh, no, it's, it is definitely in order of importance. And those first four, Scott are really what we would call the uh, the primary criteria. It's always been the uh, uh, the criteria in which we've used to evaluate candidates. Those first four have been. Uh, at the end of the day, you're looking for a student athlete that's gone out the entire year and really sought to dominate all opponents. Most years, it's been a situation where the winner has had very few non-bonus point wins. So that speaks to that. Um, you know, that, that third variable of, of dominance on the mat. I know that's always a key indicator that a lot of official Hodge Trophy uh, committee voters look at in regards to how many opponents kept the match under eight points um, during, during the season and at the NCAA tournament and postseason. And uh, obviously, the more times an athlete uh, steps on the mat, the more 
potential times there are to, to get pinned or get caught in a move or something like that or have an off day. So obviously number of matches is a key key variable as, as well. And uh, lastly, you know, it, it should certainly be spoke, spoken about, but pinning has always been uh, a major focal point for this award. So obviously you'll see that as that group of primary four criteria used to evaluate candidates. There have been some good candidates in the past that have not won the Hodge Trophy simply because they've had a handful of, of pins or less uh, total throughout the season. And we have really always sought to select a winner that uh, has gone for the fall. Uh, it's the home run of wrestling. Uh, it's what obviously brings crowds to their feet and uh, adds that, that you know, immediate uh, impact of uh, finishing off an opponent. We want to continue to emphasize that and have the award be a motivator for these guys to go for the go for the fall. So there are seven seven criteria listed. The top four are considered primary. Uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh would be secondary. Obviously, they're very uh, important to us. Things like uh, sportsmanship, citizenship. You know, we really seek every year to have a Hodge Trophy winner that for years and years to come, people are going to remember fondly as a good representative of the sport. Uh, so we certainly uh, value the fifth, sixth, and seventh criteria as well. But uh, for the most part, when people are selecting the winner, they're going to look at those top four first and then uh, get to five, six, and seven to you know, better evaluate the, uh, the finalists each year. Brian Van Clay, the publisher of Win Magazine, joins us. You can look for him online at win-magazine.com. Make sure you have your subscription either renewed or updated or sign up for a new subscription. We encourage you to do so. There's not a greater publication out there than Win Magazine. You're going to find uh, tremendous writers in there, great stories, uh, incredible coverage uh, from cover to cover. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. I want to in particular salute Mike Finn. He... Uh, he has uh, such a tremendous heart for this sport, and it really comes through in his, um, in his writing, and uh, his love for the sport is, is evident as well. And knowledge, uh, tremendous knowledge. Uh, very gentle around the edges, but, man, when you get down to the details, the guy knows his stuff. So uh, special thanks. Hats off to Mike Finn. All right, let's talk a bit about, by the way, we'll get back to sportsmanship, citizenship, and heart. And that's something I do want to talk about. But let's go back to the history of this award. In 1995, T.J. Jaworski from North Carolina started things off. And I've recently uh, rekindled my friendship with T.J. out in California. And um, he's, he's found a, a renewed interest in the sport where so many people can just be overwhelmed, Brian, by the by the sport, by the intensity, the ferocity, and the number of years. Some people need to take a step away and reevaluate and come back to the sport for the right reasons, right? Oh, that's that's definitely true, Scott. And, and TJ, obviously, is, is one of those people and one of those stories. You know, you certainly see many, many times in wrestling, it's such an intense sport for so many years that uh, you'll have student athletes or coaches get to the point where they're just uh, done with it for an extended period of time. Um, and fortunately, most of the time, those people come back, uh, and despite whatever they've gone through in life or wherever life's path leads them, uh, they end up, you know, defaulting back to the to the virtues and things they learned from uh, from wrestling as a youth up through high school and college. And uh, uh, TJ is a good man, and I'm I'm uh, glad to see that everything is uh, is going well oh, yeah. uh, for him now. Absolutely, we all take. Uh, life's roads often lead us in different directions, but generally we come back to the middle. Les Gutch has won it the year after. Kerry McCoy, the head coach of uh, Maryland, uh, won it when at Penn State. Uh, Mark Ironside won it when at Iowa. Uh, all very successful in their jobs and their careers. Stephen Neal, the former uh, Cal State Bakersfield wrestler, and then on to uh, incredible uh, history as an NFL player. Uh, and then Nick Ackerman and Kale Sanderson split it uh, in 2001. I don't want to discount Kale's initial win in 2000 because that was uh, the benchmark, I think, for him setting the standard for the balance of his career. But explain how one year you can have a co-winner of the Hodge Award. Yeah, thanks, Scott, for asking about that. I'd be happy to. So Nick Ackerman, some people know his story. Some people uh, do not. He was a double uh, amputee who... Uh, wrestled for Simpson College. They're an NCAA Division III school here in, uh, in central Iowa. And uh, he went on to beat uh, Nick Slack from Augsburg. I think Nick was a two-time 
uh, national champion coming into the finals his senior year. So uh, Nick Ackerman from Simpson College, despite uh, not having either of his legs, uh, beat the two-time NCAA Division III uh, national champ that year in the finals. And uh, I was there. Uh, I remember the moment fondly. Uh, it was one of those goosebump moments for every <laughs> single person that was in Young Arena up in Waterloo uh, that year. And uh, what Nick did was, uh, was nothing short of remarkable. And uh, uh, the wrestling community and, and certainly us on the committee wanted to salute him in a significant way. And we felt that was a very unique scenario that year that warranted a double winner of the Hodge Trophy. So uh, Kale Sanderson and Nick Ackerman split the award as co-winners uh, that year. And it has been the only time, obviously, in the history of the award we've had dual winners in the same, uh, same year. And uh, we're very proud of it. Nick was a very worthy recipient of the, uh, the Hodge Trophy, represented the sport well, and has gone on to do uh, great things uh, in life. He works for a prosthetics company out of uh, Des Moines and is still uh, you know, attached and, and tied to the sport in many ways. You bet. Kels Henderson was the only three-time winner. That significant, uh, of course, uh, but additional to his undefeated career at the collegiate level and then on to an Olympic gold medal. Eric Larkin won it in 2003, Emmett Wilson in 04. Steve Mako, the dominant big man, did not win it while at Iowa. Indeed, he won it while at Oklahoma State. I just saw him and his family in uh, New York City. It's always good to see Steve. Ben Askren had a pair of them, 2006 and seven. Brent Metcalf won it in 08 for the dominant year that he had. Jake Herbert up at Northwestern. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful story it was that year. Then Jason Ness in 2010. Jordan Burroughs, just a harbinger of good things to come from that young man, won it when at Nebraska in 2011. David Taylor, Penn State. And then it was Kyle Dake, and then David Taylor. I look at that, how it was split, and it's very reminiscent of the career that both have enjoyed, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Obviously, they became, uh, they've been longtime friends and have been rivals on the mat since they were younger and have continued their uh, matches and rivalry in through uh, college and then the postgraduate level on the freestyle uh, on the freestyle scene. So it was, yeah, it was very interesting. Obviously, in 2013, them meeting in the NCAA finals in uh, Des Moines uh, with Kyle moving up a weight to face the previous year's uh, Heisman Trophy winner and his uh, longtime friend David Taylor. So uh, that's the reason for the 2013 award going to David. Obviously, he had a great season that year. And then David Taylor followed up the next year, his senior year at Penn State, winning his second uh, Hodge Trophy. Just incredible athletes and, and really, truly nice young men coming from outstanding families. I think you're going to find that uh, a commonality amongst the, uh, the Hodge Award winners. Very nice people, uh, well-intended, uh, tremendous moral values. Logan Steber, I think, would be highly indicative of all that I've said. He was your 2015 champion. And, uh, again, in the Nike hot seat today is um, uh, a guy I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Nobody works harder in this business and the media business of uh, covering our sport than uh, Win Magazine publisher Brian Van Clay. He's our guest on the Nike Hot Seat today. All right, so let's talk a bit about those on the ballot. And then the, the second part of our conversation after we talk about the individuals on the ballot will be who actually votes and whose votes count. Is it weighted? How do we arrive at the finalists? Let's talk about the, the uh, individuals on the ballot first. Great question, Scott. So I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, we have a 45 or 46, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it's either uh, one of those two official ballots uh, that go out each year. That number uh, typically grows by one each year. We did lose uh, an official Hodge Trophy um, committee voting member and Joe Wells here over this last year. So there's typically a fluctuation of a vote or two. Uh, but the official Hodge Trophy voting committee is made up of uh, very, very similar to the way the Heisman Trophy works, uh, national wrestling media representatives from around the country that follow the sport closely. Uh, there is seven or eight of those. There's a retired college coach from each region of the country. Uh, every past Hodge Trophy winner uh, gets a vote. Uh, and then finally, um, one representative of each of the national wrestling organizations gets a vote. So there's groups like 
uh, USA Wrestling, AAU, New Way, the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, National Wrestling Coaches Association, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that each get a vote. So uh, by the time it's all said and done, there are 46 separate votes. Uh, two of those 46 votes come from our composite fan vote that happens over a three-day period on our website, which has been ongoing this week. And that's obviously a lot of fun for the fans, for the fans to have an official uh, say in selecting the, the winner. Uh, Zane Rutherford was, uh, was leading the last time I checked, just prior to getting on with this uh, interview. He had 16,871 votes. Wow. Alex Deringer was second with 11,037 votes. Kyle Snyder third with 1,174. Nashawn Garrett with just over 1,000 votes was in fourth. I refreshed the browser a few minutes later and another 1,000 people had voted. So that's been very active and fun to see uh, fans and coaches and families, as you referenced earlier, uh, voting on the, uh, on the site. But uh, those two fan votes then make up the final two of those 46 uh, official uh, ballots. It'll be interesting to see how it all boils down because – um, those inside the wrestling media, the coaches, the past champs, may have a different opinion than the fans do. And here's here's at least my my take on that is that uh, fans watch it for uh, a variety of different reasons than coaches do, and they see different uh, they see different things of value. And uh, would you agree with that? Uh, I would. Yes, I would for sure. You know, the, the reason, obviously, the Hodge Trophy Committee was, was set up in the way that it is, is we wanted numerous uh, people's opinions and um, frame of context and ability to judge candidates based on the criteria of the award that has been the same since its inception to do that accurately and in an impartial manner every year. So at the end of the day, we highly value, obviously, our past Hodge winners. Uh, input on who they see as the top athlete. They've been in those situations where they've had opponents just looking to run from them on the mat and survive the, the war, so to speak, throughout the year. They've been the guy that's, uh, that's had to weather the storm and weather the scrutiny and media pressure and the internal pressure they're putting on themselves. So obviously uh, they would be some of the best people to uh, objectively vote on, on who the most dominant student athlete is. We greatly value those retired coaches uh, and obviously the national media members that follow the sport throughout the year. They see it more than just those uh, four matches, five matches at the end of the year and at the uh, Big Ten, Big 12 and other conference qualifier tournaments. So they, uh, they know these athletes well. Uh, they've watched them throughout the year, and the sum total of the expertise, obviously, of that group, we feel very, very confident uh, we're going to get the right guy every year. And uh, the deadline for your vote, fans, is Friday, March 25th at noon Central Standard Time. That would be 1 Eastern. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a broad range. Alex Daringer, 165-pounder from Oklahoma State, the senior, recently wrapped up his collegiate career, becoming the 16th all-time Oklahoma State winner uh, of three NCAA titles. It was uh, a tremendous battle over Wisconsin's Isaac Jordan. Finishes his year 33-0, and 12 pins, uh, Tech falls seven. He had major decisions, eight of them, and decisions a total of six. Nishan Garrett is the one that's uh, falling behind, perhaps in the in the public voting, but uh, a 37 and 0 record at 133 pounds. Awfully fun to watch. Uh, ended his career with 149 victories overall, second on the school's list, 13th uh, national champion for Cornell. A total of 11. Pin- is that Nishan calling? Uh, total, <laughs> total of 11 pins, seven tech falls, seven majors, and 12 decisions. Zane Rutherford right now leads the pack at 149 pounds. He was uh, the star for Penn State, a sophomore out of Benton, PA. One year after redshirting, the two-time All-American captured his first NCAA crown. And a nice job indeed by this young man. Some say he is the best natural wrestler of the group. Others might argue that. His record, 34-0, 15 pins, Tech Falls, seven of them, majors, seven of those as well, and five general decisions. Now, Kyle Snyder. This is the odd one. I saved this one for last, Brian, because this one perhaps warrants the most discussion. Uh, this Buckeye came off a red shirt, had limited number of exposures within the regular season, 
and then uh, threw himself into a weight class that apparently he was prepared for, but many questioned because he's such a, a small heavyweight. Let's talk a bit about Kyle Snyder. What is your take on this young man from Ohio State? I'd love to talk about Kyle. He's, uh, <laughs> he's an incredible representative of the sport. Obviously, everybody knows that he is a, a world champion as of September and the youngest uh, American ever to do that. Uh, was taking an Olympic red shirt this year, obviously, for those that don't follow uh, uh, freestyle wrestling that close. Uh, he was down at uh, 213 pounds in freestyle. And then mid-year, uh, the Ohio State staff and obviously Kyle and his family decided to uh, forego the Olympic red shirt and uh, uh, compete second semester uh, in a limited amount of strategically picked duels based on the calendar on when it fit into his training cycle and specifically to very high level uh, international tournaments. Um, I think the best way to talk about it briefly in regards to Kyle Scott is that in the Heisman Trophy in football, obviously we all know that and follow it, or most of us do sure. somewhat well, uh, if there was a running back or quarterback that only played in half the games, he would never be listed as a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. It just simply would not happen. There's potential of getting hurt, and that uh, student athlete would never be looked at in the same way as somebody that uh, put the helmet on for 13-14 uh, games. Obviously, with Kyle, the committee felt very strongly that he was a worthy finalist for the award just because of the uniqueness of his situation. I think Nick Gwizdowski had won, correct me if I'm wrong, 88 or something straight matches. Uh, was, was a two-time yeah. Uh, yeah, two-time NCAA champ in his own right, and a fan and a finalist for last year's Hodge Trophy. Uh, and this incredible Buckeye sophomore moved up a weight class, wrestled in limited matches. So obviously, that increased some vulnerability in his regard uh, versus if he had wrestled the entire uh, college season. It could be even more significant that he was able to beat him and then beat him in what. Uh, was heralded in New York City as the most anticipated heavyweight championship of all time in college wrestling. So what Kyle accomplished this year was nothing short of remarkable. People are going to be talking about it for decades, and he certainly deserves to be a finalist for this year's uh, Dan Hodge Trophy. I believe Kyle Snyder will be in the conversation for quite some time. He is, his career is, has been remarkable in that he hasn't followed uh, any given path that we, we've seen before uh, out of high school from Maryland and then going to Ohio State and saying, you know what, I'm going to go out to the Olympic Training Center for a year and then come back and start his career and then take a hiccup year. And, and I, I look at this kid going, you know what, there's so much joy in him. It's evident in his style, uh, his countenance, and he just really is enjoying the process. And for me, after all, isn't that what it's about? And I think it is. You agree with that, Brian? Oh, most definitely. And you can see it in the way he competes, Scott. He uh, he, he takes the sport, obviously, incredibly seriously, as, as these top guys all do. But uh, he does it with a smile on his face. He does it with uh, dignity and, and uh, sportsmanship, obviously. Uh, he came into college expecting, hoping to be a four-time NCAA champ and was pinned last year, as we all know, by Kyvin Gadsden in the finals. You know, they, they say you learn a lot about people when, uh, uh, when, the, when the chips don't fall where they're supposed to and you're walking off the mat, obviously, as a loser. So mm -hmm. I think the amount of respect that Kyle Snyder has across the board from uh, people that uh, love him and follow him closely as well as his peers at other schools and competitors in his weight class, you know, runs deep. He's just a class act. He's a great representative for uh, U.S. wrestling, and obviously everybody's anxious to see him compete in a uh, in a solid weight class here in a couple of weeks at the Olympic trials, and uh, should he win that, obviously he'll be uh, a front runner for an Olympic gold medal uh, this August down in Rio. I held a Heisman Trophy in my hand. It was 1975 Archie Griffith, um, and I should say cradled it in my arms. It's actually quite heavy, <laughs> but <laughs> as special as that moment was in Jim Trussell's office at Ohio State, uh, it it does not come close to holding uh, David Taylor's 
uh, Dan Hodge trophy or actually shared a locker room with his uh, Hodge Award <laughs> trophy in, in Iowa City at the, at the Olympic trials. So, I mean, there's several remarkable moments that have surrounded my career with the Hodge Award. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that the, the audience out there understands that there's a lot of thought that goes into this. There's a tremendous amount of uh, uh uh, numbers and, and, and ideas behind this. It's not something that's awarded uh, lightly. And the people at Win Magazine and my fellows in, in uh, uh, the media, whether they're broadcast or print, uh, that follow this sport and the coaches and the previous winners, it all matters. And your votes count, fans. So get online right now. Online balloting is underway. And you can find the, uh, the, the link for that at win-magazine.com. Our guest on the Nike Hot Seat today has been Brian Van Clay. The last thing, Brian, I'll ask you about is heart. The heart of a champion is, is evidenced in the way he wins and the way he loses. Not everybody's going to win this award. Matter of fact, three won't. But there will be one that rises above the other three in online balloting and, and uh, overall presentation. And uh, what are your thoughts on the heart of a champion? Yeah, I appreciate you asking on that, Scott. It's, um, uh, it's integral that they're uh, a good representative of the sport and in the way they compete. You know, one of the variables, and this is going to sound kind of subjective in the way I explain it, but one of the variables I try to think through each year when making my selection is if, if you were there with your son or daughter or a buddy uh, or your wife and there was one athlete in which you said you've got to see the way this guy does it you've got to see the way this guy wrestles you can't go get popcorn when when there's any chance that this guy could be wrestling I think a lot of that speaks to heart and you see it on the mat obviously as you referenced earlier fans may uh, describe that or see it a bit differently than a coach would who sees that student athlete uh, all week in practice or has been coaching them all season. Uh, but obviously with the award, uh, we want to select a guy that uh, does it and does it in the right way uh, and shows a significant amount of, of courage and uh, intestinal fortitude, if you will. Sure. And, and lots of these athletes, you know, I look at Nashawn Garrett and, and where he's come from. Uh, to win his first NCAA championship at Cornell. This has not been an easy road for him. Obviously, growing up, Chico, California, uh, coming to Rob Cole's program, uh, losing in the finals uh, before going through disappointments, and now winning it in dominating fashion his senior year. Uh, that, that speaks to, to Nashawn's heart, and I know people that are around him uh, love him, people that are around him closely, and uh, heart is an important part of the award. Uh, a couple Final things I would comment on briefly, Scott. We did extend the fan voting until 5 p.m. tomorrow on nice. Friday. Okay. Uh, there, there was such an influx of fan voting there over the uh, first few hours that the uh, fan vote poll link went up, and so many people were uh, re-pushing it out through social media and websites that the, uh, the website crashed. Uh, the whole site has been moved to a different server, and we're now up and rolling again. And it uh, looked like fan vote numbers were approaching 40,000 already, unique uh, fan votes. So we want to encourage people through 5 p.m. Central Time tomorrow, they can still vote. Um, and probably one of the last things I was going to quickly comment on, just so people understand kind of the next steps after uh, the selection of the Hodge Trophy, when it's announced, when it's presented, that kind of thing. The winner will be announced at 12 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time next week, Monday. The student athlete always receives the award first at their uh, their wrestling banquet, which is usually uh, mid-April. Uh, and then depending on if that student athlete is at a school that has a prominent football program, what we have done a majority of the time is then also award that student athlete the Hodge Trophy publicly in front of a general sports audience um, on the football field, either at halftime or a commercial break during a fall football game. So obviously that's always a great honor. Uh, for myself, for the award founder, Mike Chapman, and the presenting sponsor, ASICS, uh, to be on the award, uh, uh, to be able to present the award publicly at a fall football game. Last fall at the Horseshoe in Columbus, there were some 108,000 people that uh, gave Logan Steber a standing ovation. So all in all, obviously, Scott, the Hodge Trophy is a great thing for wrestling. Uh, these athletes won it badly, and it's, it's fun to see wrestling get its due in this manner uh, for the top, top collegian each year to be recognized in that manner.
Nobody believes in the sport more than the publisher of Win Magazine. He's been our guest today, Brian Van Clay. I want to spend a, send out a very special thank you to the presenting sponsor of the Hodge Trophy, Nick Gallo and, and company at, uh, at ASICS. They just do a tremendous job. And, uh, you know, behind the scenes, they are always there. It's an amazing thing. So thanks to ASICS for being the presenting sponsor. Zane Rutherford leads right now for Penn State University with some, uh, well, just shy of 18,000 votes. Derringer uh, from Oklahoma State with uh, a little over 13,000. And then it's Snyder and Garrett. Will your vote count? I think it should. Get online right now and make sure your vote does get registered at win-magazine.com. You heard Brian Van Clay announce it right there. They're going to continue to uh, receive online balloting by uh, uh, through 5 o'clock on Friday this week. So make sure you are a part of the success of this year's Hodge Award. And we'll, of course, have the announcement on next week's Takedown Wrestling uh, television show. And hopefully Brian will come on on Monday and give us the... Uh, the lowdown and, and how it all shook out. Brian, we appreciate the time today. Fascinating conversation on what we see as uh, uh, the most significant award presentation in in our sport, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Again, wind-magazine.com. I'm Scott Casper for Takedown. Our very special guest has been sitting in the Nike hot seat. Special uh, appreciation goes out to Mike Finn as well. The publisher of Wind Magazine, Brian Van Clay.